This video contains commentary and analysis of a YouTube video and may include copyrighted material. The use of such material is in accordance with the fair use provisions of Section 107 of the United States Copyright Law. The commentary provided is for criticism, commentary or educational purposes, and aims to contribute to public discourse and understanding. The use of copyrighted material is transformative and adds significant value to the original content. The inclusion of any copyrighted material is not intended to infringe upon copyright. And I strive to use what is necessary to support the commentary. This video expresses the opinions of the creator and should not be considered as professional advice. The creator make no representations or warranties regarding the accuracy or completeness of the information provided. Viewers are encouraged to engage in their own independent research and critical thinking. The creator does not endorse or promote any specific products, services, or views unless explicitly stated. By watching this video, you agree to the terms mentioned in this disclaimer. Thank you. In the realm of true crime and missing persons investigations, Jim Terry has emerged as a controversial figure, transitioning from the arena of football to becoming a self-proclaimed private investigator. His rise, however, is clouded with allegations of exploiting the vulnerable families of missing persons for personal gain. This expose delves into the troubling experiences of those who sought Terry's assistance, only to find themselves ensnared in a web of broken promises, alleged harassment, and a lack of tangible results. As we uncover the unsettling details of Terry's methods, we shed light on the risks that families face when turning to online figures in the desperate search for their missing loved ones. This is the unsettling narrative that unfolds as we delve into a self-proclaimed expert in missing persons cases turned YouTube sensation. As his now banned channel, Jim Terry TV, amassed thousands of followers hungry for true crime content. The families who sought his assistance began to question not only his methods, but also his true intentions. Join me and listen to the stories of those who believed in Terry's promises, only to face more profound nightmares, and shed light on the controversies that have thrust him into the spotlight, a spotlight that may reveal more than he's comfortable with. The initial promise, a thought of hope in dark times. In the heart-wrenching search for missing loved ones, families often find themselves navigating a landscape of despair. Ashley Easterling, a mother desperately seeking her son Robert Alex Easterling, stumbled upon a glimmer of hope in the form of Jim Terry. Indoor arena football kicker turned private investigator, Terry presented himself as a beacon of expertise, ready to lead families through the harrowing journey of locating their missing relatives. In April 2022, with her son missing for 40 agonizing days, Ashley Easterling was at her wit's end. Local law enforcement seemed to have hit a dead end leaving the Easterling family frustrated and lost in a sea of unanswered questions. Enter Jim Terry, who, in a cold and gruff manner, offered a lifeline, claiming to be a seasoned private investigator specializing in missing person cases. Terry assured Easterling that finding her son would be his sole focus. Desperation often blinds reason, and Easterling, yearning for any possibility of reuniting with her son, saw Terry as the answer to her prayers. Despite his abrasive demeanor, Terry presented a portfolio of past cases, appearances on true crime YouTube channels and news articles, cultivating an illusion of legitimacy. Convinced that she had found a dedicated ally in the search for her son, Easterling entrusted Terry with $3,000 upfront for his services, with an agreement for an additional $1,500 as circumstances allowed. Initially, Terry seemed genuinely invested in bringing Alex home, maintaining frequent communication with Easterling. Yet, as the days passed, the facade began to crumble. Terry's supposed investigative efforts appeared to be mere echoes of information the family had already gathered. By June 13, less than two weeks after being hired, Terry abruptly cut off all contact with the Easterling family, leaving them in a state of anguish. Little did Easterling know that her experience was not isolated. Discovering later that Terry had taken on multiple cases simultaneously shattered the illusion of exclusivity. The promise of focused dedication turned out to be a smokescreen. 
leaving families like Easterlings questioning Terry's intentions and the authenticity of his services. The initial promise of hope had unraveled, unveiling a darker side to Jim Terry's involvement in the world of missing person investigations. As the curtain lifted on Jim Terry's private investigator persona, the families who had sought his aid found themselves entangled in a complex dance of allegations and fervent denials. What began as a desperate plea for assistance evolved into a bitter dispute over unfulfilled promises and questionable professional ethics. Ashley Easterling, alongside others who had turned to Terry, alleged that he charged substantial fees for services that were never delivered. Easterling claimed that the initial $3,000 payment made for Terry's investigative efforts yielded no meaningful results, leaving her family in a state of prolonged agony. Terry's abrupt severance of communication, according to Easterling, only deepened the wounds, adding insult to injury. In response to these accusations, Jim Terry vehemently denied any wrongdoing. He contended that Easterling's family failed to pay him in full, using this as justification for cutting off ties. Terry insisted that his other clients had given him permission to handle multiple cases concurrently. A stark contrast to his public assertion that he exclusively focused on one case at a time. He declared, The one mistake these people made was lying about me and trying to pick a fight. As the dispute unfolded, Terry shifted the blame onto the families themselves, accusing them of spreading false information and tarnishing his reputation. His defense took a combative tone, with Terry stating, Never throw rocks. At a guy holding a machine gun, portraying himself as a victim of unfounded accusations. The families, however, remained steadfast in their claims, contending that Terry had exploited their vulnerable states and charged for services he had no intention of fulfilling. The allegations painted a picture of a former indoor arena football player turned private, investigator whose actions fell far short of the promises he made to families desperate for answers. Caught in the crossfire of conflicting narratives, the fractured trust left in Jim Terry's. Wake highlights the complexities and challenges faced by those seeking help in the realm of missing person investigations. The once solid ground of hope had crumbled, replaced by a terrain of uncertainty, animosity, and unanswered questions. Jim Terry's journey from the arena football field to the contentious realm of true crime. Investigation is marked by a series of controversies and legal entanglements, painting a multifaceted portrait of a figure now at the center of a growing storm. In the early 2000s, Terry gained notoriety in his home state of Florida through pay-for-play games, designed to garner attention for high school football athletes. Investigated as a potential scam by the Tampa Bay Times, Terry's activities raised eyebrows and cast shadows on his ventures in the sports arena. Years later, around 2008, Terry faced felony charges related to grand theft and fraud concerning football equipment sales. Although the charges were dropped, Terry's reputation remained stained and questions lingered about the circumstances that led to the legal action. Undeterred by these challenges, Terry took a turn towards private investigation in 2018. Inspired by peers working as bounty hunters during arena football's offseason, he enrolled in a two-week college course in Florida and obtained a two-year intern-level private investigator's license upon completion, registering his business in Mississippi, a state that doesn't mandate private investigators to be licensed. Terry positioned himself in a territory with less regulatory scrutiny. However, Terry's reputation in Mississippi was far from pristine. The president of the state's Private Investigators Association once described it as a state of magnet for unscrupulous people wanting to work as private investigators. Terry, though, insisted that he had always operated within the bounds of the law and chose Mississippi to avoid low-paid intern work in Florida after earning his private investigator qualification. As Terry transitioned from the arena football field to the world of private investigation, his career trajectory became increasingly murky. The controversies that dogged him in sports found an echo in his newfound profession, setting the stage for the tumultuous path that would ultimately lead him to the center of a true crime storm. For families desperately searching for missing loved ones, the internet becomes both a lifeline and a perilous domain. The World Wide Web, a tool that can potentially aid in solving cases, 
morphs into a dangerous landscape where personal information shared on platforms like Facebook becomes fodder for opportunistic individuals. Todd Matthews, media director of the Doe Network, warns of the perilous exposure families face when sharing details about their missing relatives online. The vulnerability deepens as families, fueled by desperation and determination, search for a way forward. The emotional toll of seeking a missing person, combined with the eagerness to uncover any lead, sometimes clouds judgment. Families, yearning for answers, may inadvertently become targets for those who exploit their distress. As we delve deeper into Jim Terry's involvement in missing person investigations, it becomes imperative to scrutinize the specific tactics employed by this true crime figure. The unfolding stories of families who sought his assistance shed light on the controversial methods that have thrust Terry into the center of a storm. Examining these examples provides a nuanced understanding of how his actions have impacted the very individuals who turned to him for help. We are also going to listen to the wild, wild west of licensing for private investigators in Mississippi. In Mississippi, even felons can be private investigators. Without a license in Mississippi, a person can't practice medicine, work as an architect, install hearing aids or perform massage therapy, but anybody, even a felon, can work as a private investigator. Some felons are working as private investigators in Mississippi, or become felons after they start working as pies. Franco Corleone fled Mississippi rather than risk that fate. Legally changing his last name to that of the Godfather, he worked with dogs and also as a private investigator. In 1998, a Rankin County grand jury indicted him, accusing him of obstructing justice in Chancery Court. Private investigator Dale Jones, who worked with state troopers on the case, said Corleone tried to blackmail a married man after setting him up with a woman and then taking photographs of the two of them talking. Jones said they arrested two men, but Corleone fled. The two arrested had their charges dismissed years later. Corleone's file is missing from Rankin County Circuit Court. A clerk suggested his case may have been expunged. Corleone could not be reached for comment. Mississippi has just become a magnet for unscrupulous people wanting to work as private investigators, said Richard A. Brooks, president of the Mississippi Private Investigators Association. Mississippi is the only state in the South, and one of only five in country, that fails to require licensing of private investigators. Because of a lack of licensing, the 40-member association has been forced to conduct background checks, Brooks said. We had to deny memberships because they were pedophiles. We want to grow, but we can't accept members like that. Earlier this year, the Mississippi House unanimously passed a bill that would have licensed private investigators and have that licensing overseen by a board funded from those licensing fees. But the bill never made it out of the Senate Judiciary A Committee. Chairman W. Briggs Hobson III said the proposal for a private investigators board came at the same time as a push to reduce the number of state boards. The bill he rejected needed some more work and a little more time under a microscope, he said. In addition, he said, there has been no public outcry over this issue. Brooks said when a lawmaker said this to him, he responded, then why did you license cosmetologists? Because Mississippi doesn't require a license for a private investigator, anyone can pay the business license fee, as low as $20, and get access to all the databases that a private investigator has access to, he said. He could be a serial rapist. Veteran private investigator Charlie Soms has licenses from a number of other states, which include requirements for continuing education. Also, you have to have liability insurance and car insurance, he said. You have to pass a background check. The licensing boards give citizens a place to go to file complaints if investigators cross the line, he said. In Mississippi, people have no place to go but the Better Business Bureau. Failing to license private investigators makes no sense, he said. We regulate everything. The guy that sprays your house for bugs is trained. 
Kathleen Cook, an attorney from Madison, said a private investigator, who also happened to have a criminal record, used a zoom lens to get a gate code so he could sneak into a gated community where her client lived. Licensing private investigators is a consumer protection issue, Cook said. It's a public safety issue. In Mississippi, private investigators have no professional standards, she said. They have no code of ethics. They have no background checks. And they're accountable to no one. Terry R. Cox of Tupelo, immediate past national director of the National Association of Legal Investigators, said what's happening in Mississippi right now is wide open, and it's an injustice to the public. While investigating a fatal accident involving two deaths, he said a private investigator contacted him, saying he had information. When Cox ran the man's name through a database, he discovered the investigator was a felon. In addition to that, Mississippians have little recourse if the private investigator takes the money and runs, he said. We license those that braid people's hair, but we don't license those involved in life and death decisions. That's scary. Brooks said private investigators barred in other states just move across the state line in Mississippi. In 2009, Michael Anthony Allen pleaded guilty to federal charges after stealing checks of $15,083 from Baldwin Legal Investigations in Mobile. After that conviction, he opened a Mississippi office in Moss Point called Mach 1 Investigative Group. He could not be reached Friday for comment. Alabama has 400 licensed private investigators, and Paula McCaleb, executive director for the Alabama Private Investigation Board, said the licensing has stopped some felons from getting into business. That's where the rubber meets the road. In a unique arrangement, she serves as executive director for six different boards, all of them supported strictly by the licensing fees collected. The lack of a licensing law makes it easy for some to take advantage, said Jim Castile, president of the Alabama Private Investigators Association. Before the law passed in Alabama in 2012, he knew of a case in which a woman spent $20,000 for a private investigator. She told me that his girlfriend would pick up the money, he said. Turned out he was in jail for burglary six months of the eight-month period she was paying him. He didn't even have a valid driver's license. There was another case in Albertville, Alabama, where a wife paid $10,000 to a private investigator to investigate whether her husband was being faithful. She found out later the husband paid off the investigator to stop investigating. He said one investigator back then was taking advantage of clients by running up costs on clients' credit card bills. The investigator even had a license tag that read, 5 cat a. Without a licensing system that can be enforced, a grandmother may spend thousands from her savings to hire a private investigator, whose actions lead to litigation, he said. All of a sudden, there's a lawsuit that wipes out her savings, he said. She didn't realize the state didn't regulate and that anybody can be a private investigator. A licensing system, he said, protects the consumer, and it's needed. Contact Jerry Mitchell at 601-961-7064 or jmitchell at jacksongannett.com. Follow at Jmitchell News on Twitter. Doing good, sir. Yeah, how are you? how are you? I'm hanging in there, guys. I'm maintaining in this land of haters. And uh, first of all, I am extremely tickled to be on a format like this. I am still learning this YouTube universe. But it seems like there's two sides and two different types of camps when it comes to true crime and YouTube. There's people with backgrounds and, and history and involvement in this. And then there's a bunch of uh, frustrated housewives that put on a ton of makeup, read through Wikipedia, and, and take money from people that ask questions in a chat room. So I'm glad to be on the on the first version of that. Well, it's really for reasons I was brought in. And I'm just going to shoot you straight. I'm not for everybody. Anybody who's followed my career, which has now been over five years, uh, closer to six, knows I'm a straight shooter. I'm not in this to make friends. I have a very unique practice as a private investigator based out of Biloxi, Mississippi, a state that has the wild west of licensures. 
And I did complete my schooling in Florida and then took my information and, and my background that I had in, in the CC license, which is the intern license, and just opened up the business in, um, in Mississippi. It would be the same thing as if I went to um, medical school in the United States and then didn't want to do all the residency and became a dentist in the Philippines. You could still be a dentist in the Philippines and help people and do what you do without all the constraints or the red tape of the state of Florida, which is what I did in the Mississippi. And people don't understand that. But a missing persons case. And let me be very clear. I, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is there is a lot of these shows that have former cops, former detectives, NYPD this, L.A. County that detective law enforcement military guy this and they won't touch me they won't touch me with a 10-foot pole so the fact that you're letting me do this on the program it means the world to me because i'm going to learn something here today oh but well, we're going to learn something too i think my first question and, and you're you're kind of hinting on that my first question is why don't you tell me I, listen i i was a police officer i have been called to several pi calls where you know maybe it was a peeping tom or stalker and then find out he's got credentials he's a pi right i've had many cops mm -hmm. leave the industry for pi but i don't know myself exactly what a pi is can you just brief briefly because i know we want to get into the heart of this briefly tell me what really a pi is and what makes them different than law enforcement and may, what made you want to be a pi rather than be law enforcement well, I had a long history and still have a long history in the indoor and arena football leagues. The arena football league itself folded many years ago, but many of the teams that were in that league or that I played with or against have now moved over to the indoor and arena football world. That's where 22 years of my career has been spent. Um, that's my real job. In the last uh, few years of my career, a lot of guys I played ball with were gorillas. They were bounty hunters, skip tracers, and they said, we think you'd be good at this. I don't look like it on this, but I'm almost 6'3 and a half, 225, 230 pounds, which is big for a kicker. So I don't look like a little small place kicker. They said, you don't have any felonies. You could carry a firearm. A lot of guys that I played ball with that were bounty hunters in the off season couldn't. They said, we think you'd be good at this. You have an ability to talk to people. My background in college, having played college football at an HBCU, where I was the only white student at Clark Atlanta University. I never had a white teammate, never had a a white teacher. Um, my minor uh, was black history, and, and you could get that amongst any of the four colleges that were on the campus, which averaged about 17,000. Uh, the fact that I was a minority as a white guy at an HBCU made me and gave me the ability to speak with anybody. I've never been in a hood that I felt uncomfortable in. I've never been in uh, a white a, neighborhood that been able to that. You can read people, like you said, read the room pretty well. Some of these guys said it. I looked into private investigating. I took the classes in the state of Florida. I actually took the classes with my mom at Hillsborough Community College. It was several weeks of classes. People seem to think you do this over a weekend or several weekends. Maybe that's an option. It wasn't for me, but they didn't tell you when you took the courses that at the end, you had to understudy somebody for two years. I was making too much money still playing in the National Arena League or the National Indoor Football League or the Indoor Football Leagues. So what I did uh, is I went ahead and I just heard that a buddy of mine was a cop in Mississippi. He said, Jim, you could open up immediately here. You could have a license, a licensing here in Mississippi. Now, licensing in Mississippi is the interesting part. It's not the type of licensing that is, exists in other states. Currently, there is six states that you can have a private investigating license in that's not a private investigating licensure, like there is in Ohio or Connecticut or Florida or even Texas. You need a business license, but you still need a business license to be a licensed private investigator in the state of Mississippi. Some of the things that people think you need that you don't are a brick and mortar building, that you have to have a Mississippi driver's license, or that you have a have to residency in the state of Mississippi. That's not true. The six states are Colorado, Mississippi, South Dakota, Wyoming, Okay, you have Alaska and then you have Idaho. Those states, anybody that's in this chat room, even convicted sex offenders and child predators could go to these states and open up a private investigating license. It's incredible that these states exist, but there there's more. When I started, there was only, I think, three. Now there's six. You can also be a private investigator in states if you're under an attorney. I could walk into the state of Kentucky right now, which I've never, ever done any work in, and be a private investigator if I decide to work under an attorney. And there is a lot of things that a private investigator could do to answer your original question that the cops, that the popos can't do. And that's why my business is through the roof. And that's what I couldn't wait to explain to you because people say, well, I'll just call the cops. Not so, Jim, so on that real quick, not to interrupt you, but what um, can you give us? And then we're going to start moving right along into Dylan a little bit. But can you give us a couple of examples of things that PIs can do that local law enforcement would not be 
able to? Well, first of all, I can leave the state. I can leave the county. I can go to states. A police officer in Biloxi, Mississippi can't go to Jackson and arrest somebody without certain criteria. He right. can't go to Idaho, can't go to Wyoming. So it's the difference between <clears throat> a local police chief and Batman. The, uh, there's, there's absolutely no jurisdiction in some cases. Sure. Number two, some of these detectives and, and police officers, <clears throat> they have 300 cases on their desk. And last I checked, the cops probably are not going to go stake out a TGI Fridays to see if somebody's wife is cheating on them. So I can do cases that cops won't touch, cheating housewives. Uh, well, things that are not necessarily illegal, right? Immoral, but not illegal. So. Correct. But but what does a private investigator do that a cop can't do? Let me tell you, I dedicate 24 hours a day, seven days a week to one case if I want. Cops got 300 cases on his desk, rapes, murders. I found 16-year-old kids before, called the sheriff's department. They said, hey, listen, somebody just killed a baby by putting it in an oven. We'll get to your 16-year-old runaway with daddy issues later. So what I can do is I can go ahead and, and definitely be a 24 hour, seven day a week phone call for the family to look into information that police can't. So there is a hell of a lot of things. Cops, detectives, still the best in the world at what they do. But if it's a borderline crime or a missing person, which is what we're going to talk about today, you can't go pissing on the cops for something that's not a crime. They got police work to do unless right. there's a, a crime scene. Make sense? I, I, Absolutely. It makes sense. I, I, you know, I, I, did you ever think about being a cop? No. No, I should never. Uh, no. And, and let me tell you something. Private invest. There's a lot of and this is where the area is gray to me. And I won't stay on this long. Uh, to me, private investigators and police officers are apples and grapefruits. The worst private investigators I've ever met are cops. I'm going to be quite honest with you because they're looking for a crime. Ninety nine percent of the cases I work on, there's no crime. So I'm not looking and I've had I've worked on cases like Gloria Alvarado in Detroit. When I found her and had her delivered to the detective, he got fired the next day. How could a private investigator on his couch at the beach in Mississippi get a girl delivered to you in a Walmart and you couldn't find her? Demotion. He was gone. Call him. Well, I, well, you know, I, I mean, what what was your I, I mean, because listen, like we've we've had lots of informants, lots of people yeah. find people that we can't. We understand that. And, and and I think most supervisor would understand that just because you're a cop that you were bound by certain rules that it is easier sometimes sure. for people to find them because we're bad. But what makes you think he got fired because you found him? I mean, was it, did he call you and say you got me fired? Because his his uh, his his uh, superior told him if you go to that Walmart and that girl shows up with the news stations there because this guy put it all together don't come back. He didn't come back. He had that conversation. So he talked to me about it. Um, and, and listen, that wasn't my goal in that thing. But what I mean by this is I wasn't looking for a crime. And the reason that he got fired or demoted wasn't, I don't think, because I found him before he did. Like I said, he's got a lot bigger cases on his desk. It was because they couldn't prosecute the kid that set her and put her over at his grandparents' house for two weeks because I had poisoned the chain. But like I told the parents, do you want her found or do you want her prosecuted if she's found? Bring our daughter home and that's what I did. That's a big difference between what a cop does and what a private investigator does. But I still bet on the cops and the detectives 99 out of 100 times with the exception of the things I mentioned. That's, that's Into the Dylan Rounds case? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yep. I had a couple of different, and I'm going to be careful how I say this, but a couple different people that follow this stuff. There is a whole community of people that think this is entertainment. And some of those people are quote unquote quasi press. They contacted me, said, hey, this is close to a kid's case you worked in Boise, Idaho, a boy that I found in Bad Axe, Michigan. That boy's name was Anthony Smith. You could look it up. You could contact his parents. He'll vouch for me 100%. Anthony Smith, I rescued from a um, militia in Bad Axe, Michigan. I harassed the militia leader so much, they dropped him off at the police station. So that case had a couple of people, a couple of people that liked me in that area. And they said, you ain't going to believe this. We think this kid might have run away to a militia group. We think this kid might have. At first, when I was first. Okay, so so somebody somebody calls you. Um, has at what, what point of Dylan being missing did you get the call, do you think? Proceed to call the police. So go ahead. Sorry. So I, I don't want to say day five, day six. So based on those people that contacted me, and this has happened in a lot of cases, I contacted the family whose cell phone numbers were on a flyer, which is dangerous. I contacted the mother. Um, didn't go well. Contacted the father. We talked. Okay, to the all right. What didn't go well about con you contacted the mother? Hung up on me. I, now I have, I'm a private investigator who talks fast. 
Yeah. I got a Florida number, but I'm based out of Mississippi. And the name of my company is Gulf Coast Investigation. So when she got a call, I think at that time, she had already gotten a lot of calls from like maybe psychics or uh, search and rescue people or, or people that just thought that this was interesting. So she hung up on me. She didn't know who I was. Called the father. I explained to who I was. I told him I'd give him a free consultation. My business, and I heard you guys say this at the beginning that I was fired. You can't fire a guy who was paid in full up front. They can choose not to work with me. But I'm not an hourly Okay, that's employee. a true distinction. Sure, yeah. I get that. You're well, right about that. I've never been fired from a case. Or they just I, yeah, I, they I, wanted a, a, a cease and desist, right, essentially from the well, case. Well, no, the, the, the mother did on a couple of phone calls. The people that I spoke with that told me to get a hold of them based on my other cases called me the next day and said, hey, how did it go? Did you talk to them? Because there there, there's like 35 unlicensed PIs in Idaho. Sure. And, I, and then none of them handle only strictly missing persons cases. I said, well, they hung up on me. And they says, oh. That ain't good. Let me give you the aunt's number and the grandparents' number. They're the ones that own the farm. I contacted Mrs. Wells. We talked for two or three days on the phone. She gave me strict marching orders. And I talked to the grandparents who own the property. They are high up in the Mormon church. This is the grandparents of the young man that went missing. And Miss Wells, the aunt, Venmoed me the money up front and full and said, go to it. But here's the caveats in the case. And this is very important. And that's the, that's where this thing gets weird. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, two questions there. Um, look, I'm trying to unpack it all. Um, one, uh, so you get a call that a, uh, uh, that the group that you sold the militia case for, they called you and said, you might be interested in this case. No, so wait, you let me, let me explain this. So Cause I don't, I don't remember all of who these people are. Sure, there that's is, fine. That's fine. There is a million of these Facebook pages out there. Some yeah. of them like me, yeah. some of them don't. Sure. They'll contact me if they know there's a case I worked in. They see me I on shows you. like this and they like me. So they send me flyers all the time. Uh, okay. One of them okay. was this kid's flyer. So I called the numbers that was on, I got you. I got on their you. recommendations. The parents blew me off. I go back. Right. And say, we want to write a story. What did they say? And I said, they hung up on me. And they go, well, we don't want to write a story that the parents are hanging up on a private investigator who was going to talk to them for free. Would you at least call the grandparents? And when I did, that's when we went over things for a couple of days. They told me what you, you get paid in full. Am I allowed to ask you how much they paid you or no? I want to say, and I've gotten that question a lot. I'd have to look at my Venmo. I'll tell you what, you want me to look at my Venmo so I can tell you the exact amount? I, look, I, I don't know that it matters. I, maybe a ballpark. Give me yeah, a ballpark. Right around $4,000. Oh, okay. So okay. we're not talking like tens of thousands of dollars here. No, I mean, I, I should have you okay. negotiating these for me. No, I wish. Yeah. I, okay. Um, Don't forget my, my, now the, the, let me tell you why that's inexpensive. Okay. Okay. I'm not flying out there, not living out there. I am gathering information on the phone from two time zones away to put okay. you guys are sugarcoating it. And I would like for you, and I'll, I'll explain why. And this is what I want to bounce off of you. Can you please put that lady's comment up there again? Would you mind doing uh, that? Let's see Candace. Um, Her name is yeah, Candace. Yeah. Keep, it's, keep it's in okay, mind, Jim. Okay. Give us a second. Eric is uh, doubling as um, way, host and producer. Well, well, I, look, I don't. I, look, we can we can address Candace here in a minute. I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get get into that. Well, I want to keep this about you put Dylan. A photo and her name and her information up there. Who says I'm trashy? And I'd like to explain why that is. Well, look, 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 I, I want I want you to train. I want you to do that. But if we start doing that in the chat, she's we're gonna a get former lost forever. client. She's a former client whose kid was found in Los Angeles under a bridge and refused oh, okay. to go home to her because he'd rather do drugs than when he was okay. found. Oh, okay. All right. Well, no, listen, that's, that's, that's very private. I don't want to put, well, I mean, that. these are all very family. I know. I, she has, I know. She has a current husband who's a drug addict. Who okay. So I think that she put, so she put her comment up, right? And so we, then we address it. And, and I, said, okay, it. I think I we, it. we even said that you Let's, weren't really trashing the kid. Her so comments. I, I don't think you were trashing the kid. I don't think you're trashing the kid, but I don't want to trash her kid either. Um, let's just right. keep on track with what you're going on. I don't like, well, to I was going to trash her. Kid, I was going to trash her, but I, <laughs> I get it. Okay. 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 Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Let's bring this back. Let's re let's reel this back in real fast. So we, we are up to this, this, uh, weird guy in the desert. We, we no, know we're not this up to the weird guy in the desert. Hold on. We, we got to stop right there. My friend. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to. You have a way of getting people talking on the phone. You called me the room, like we talked about earlier. You called me uh, to ask him on the show. And I thought, you, dude, if anybody in the world would have called me the way you did, I'd have hung up on them and I would have blocked their phone number. Maybe called the police. You do have a way of getting people to talk to you. So I am interested in this very much. Killed Dylan. It would be a very easy thing to be like, well, he was gay thinking that maybe that has a negative connotation to it or that it could send you down a rabbit. Now I would not listen to that at all. 
wh why was it important for you to know? And I, I'm asking, I don't know the answer, but I feel like you get very passionate about this. And, and, and I've seen that it is a point of contention. I don't know why, I, because I think it's, it's okay to have a theory that somebody's gay. It's not a theory. But why, but why would it be important to the case if he was sure. gay? Okay, well, let's get into that. So I, I did exactly what you said. You and I are spending an incredible amount of time based on the fact, because it's a trigger word nowadays. Calling somebody gay is a trigger word. I, I didn't think much about it. I says, he's lying. He's full of shit. I thought the exact same thing you did. I was more interested in where he showered, where he slept, where he ate, where, where, if it was in the drugs and all that. But I had to ask that question. And when I started asking that question to other people in town who were school teachers, who were so, relatives. So, so, so you talked to a school teacher in which town? That town. Lucen? Montello, Lucen? Lucen's where he lives. Guys, okay. listen. Okay. Right, you got Investigator and former military and civilian law enforcement officer is hoping to add more protection for this line of business. Richard Brooks is president of the Professional Investigation Association. Brooks is pushing to get House Bill 713 passed through the legislature. It would require private investigators are licensed. As it stands now, anyone can start up a PI business, even convicted criminals. This bill doesn't cover process servers or security guards or anything like that. This bill covers private investigators. But in Mississippi, you have to check them out because you don't know what you're getting. Brooks says the public and most lawmakers are unaware this line of business is unregulated. He equates Mississippi with the Wild West when it comes to the private investigator business and says it's long past due for more stringent oversight. And some lawmakers want all private investigators to have a license. House Bill 713 would require all private investigators to undergo background checks and pass a written exam. Representative Mark Baker authored the bill. So far, Mississippi is the only state in the southeast to not require private investigators to be licensed. Advocates say this bill is really important and needs to pass. This is important because you've got convicted felons running around as PIs. I mean, uh, the person that cuts your hair has a license. The person that does your wife's nails has a license. But private investigators don't have to have anything but a pulse. Now the bill has died many times when it's been put before lawmakers. Today is also the last day for any bill such as this one to make it out of committees or they could die. Could a convicted felon be hired to watch you and your family? Well, a new bill is looking to change that. News Channel 12's Paris Thomas tells us what House Bill 713 could mean for the state's private investigators. There's no requirements. Beating heart is the requirement. A requirement private investigator Richard Brooks is hoping will soon change with the Mississippi Private Investigation Regulatory Act or House Bill 713. But the citizens have no way of judging the individual they're hiring as a PI's background, training, experience, ethics, nothing. I mean, you can walk out of prison and start your PI company in the morning. Currently, there are no laws regarding private investigators being licensed in the state, but if a law is passed, that will all change. Everyone will have to meet certain requirements in order to become a private investigator. Uh, every PI is going to have to go through a background check. They're going to have to submit fingerprints. Um, they're going to have to have so much experience. Brooks says it's all about protection. But the number one reason for this bill is to protect the citizens. They don't know what they're getting. I mean, it's the Wild West out here when it comes to PIs. Uh, because there's no licensure, there's no background. So you could be hiring a convicted felon. Maurice Thomas, WJTV News, Channel 12. Well, the bill has already passed the House and currently sits before a Senate Judiciary Committee.